Thank you, and we trust this morning you'll stay with us a while on the broadcast of this evening, or wherever you're getting this broadcast at, and get a blessing for a few minutes with us we study from the Word of God. As a matter of fact, my subject for today is how to miss a blessing. Now, this may be a rather unusual subject to preach about, but the longer I live and the more I continue in the ministry, now after about, oh, 32 years of it, the more and more I'm convinced that there are many Christians who have a talent for missing every spiritual blessing God has for them in life. I don't know why this is, but I've seen it many, many times. I could recite example after example where a Christian had placed before him by the grace of God everything he needed for victory in his own life, for blessing, and somehow or another, every time opportunity knocked the door, he wasn't at home. I've seen young people, for example, some young men that were complaining about the carnal condition of Christian young women and wanting a good wife and not knowing where to find one and being down loud on the women and convinced that all of them were good for nothing. I've seen those young men have a chance to hear girls' groups from the Rebecca home, Bethesda home for girls, uh, roll-off girls, and hear those girls give testimonies and their salvation and their consecration. And the day they would show up in church, those young ladies, those young men, that would be the weekend they weren't there. The longer I live, the more I realize that some Christian people have a, they, they develop kind of habit of skipping services, and somehow or another by the grace of God or by the machination of the devil, they miss every service that could have done them some good. And the ones they hit, finally, are the ones they don't need. It's a very strange thing. So I'm going to talk this morning for a while, or wherever you're getting the broadcast, it might be evening or otherwise in various places. I'm going to talk to you this morning about uh, how to miss a blessing. Now, if I had any text for this message, it'd be 2 Samuel chapter 6. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, you'll find one of the strangest stories recorded in the Word of God. In this chapter, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David the king is coming home. And he's moving the ark of God from its temporary uh, place in uh, Shiloh and Ephraim down to Jerusalem to be placed into the uh, tabernacle there and there to await the building of the temple under Solomon. This ark of the covenant has been uh, mishandled the first trip down to Jerusalem. And as you remember, Uzzah tried to put forth his hand and steady the cart that was shaking and about to uh, dump the ark in the road. And the Lord struck him there for his error. And so the ark remained in the house of Odebedim the Gittite for several months until David finally uh, found out the proper way to carry that ark on the shoulders of the priest as prescribed in the Levitical regulations in the book of Numbers. Now he's come down to the town and brought the ark with him the right way this time. And as he's brought the ark down, he's gone ahead of it and shouted and rejoiced with singing and dancing. And as I uh, jumped up and down in front of the ark and praised God and generally carried on like a fanatic. And coming into town, his wife looks out the window and sees him. All David has on is a linen ephod, which is the equivalent of a T-shirt and perhaps a, a karate gi. It's about what it amounts to. And in coming into town, dancing and praising God in front of the ark, his wife looks out the window and the Bible said when she saw him singing and dancing, she despised him in her heart. Now when David comes home and walks into his household to bless his wife and give her a blessing, she makes fun of him. And she says, how glorious was the king of Israel who did uncover himself this day before uh, his handmaids. She's worrying about what the women thought about her blue-blooded husband. She was a king's daughter herself. She worried about her image being damaged by her husband's uh, carrying on out in the street. And David turns to her and says, just about as sharply as you could rebuke anybody, he says, I wasn't dancing and singing before the handmaid, sister. I was singing and dancing before the Lord who chose me before he chose your father's house. He was referring to the fact that her father Saul had been put away and had, uh, was killed in battle, committed suicide, and God had chosen him to replace her father. You couldn't find a more vicious... Uh, address given to a wife anywhere in the Word of God. And the Bible says uh, because of that, because Michael, David's wife, despised him in her heart, she had no children to the day of her death. Now, Michael missed a blessing. And I want to say some things about that on today's broadcast. 
First of all, <clears throat> you should want to get a blessing. The word blessing means to be happy. And we say, blessed be God, we mean uh, glory to God and let God be happy, let God be content, let God be pleased with our lives. When we ask God to bless us, we're asking God to make us happy. That's what the word means. Folks talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Germans say, on Gottes Segen ist alles gelegen, which means everything depends upon God's blessing. All depends upon God's blessing. That's the motto of my family, which I have hanging in my house, my coat of arms. On Gottes gelegen, on Gottes Segen ist alles gelegen. You should want a blessing. Did you know Jacob was so anxious to get a blessing that he wrestled with an angel and went through life with a hip out of joint and limped the rest of his life just to get a blessing? You know what Esau did when he found out he couldn't get a blessing? He wept bitterly. And the Bible said he sought no place, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. You ought to want to get a blessing. Now, I don't know whether you want God to bless you or not. The greatest blessings in life come from God. They don't come from men. When God reaches over the balance of heaven and pats a man on the back, it's worth 15,000 pats by men. I don't know of any satisfaction. Are you listening? I don't know any satisfaction in this world like having God Almighty commend me before men and show me He's with me and is going to back me up. If there's a greater blessing than that before man, I don't know what it is. You ought to want a blessing. I'm not saying you have to be big or be get a big blessing. A little blessing will do. Just doing something for God, God wants done, and being blessed because of it is one of the greatest things in life any human being can experience. I have no sympathy with you people who spend all your time watching television and think a great blessing is to win a sweepstakes or to win an Oscar or a Heisman Trophy. That's what we call the kiddie stuff. That's for the kiddies in the playpen. An old-time preacher said, the man in this life who is a success is the man who finds out what God wants him to do and does it. If there's anything greater in this life than finding out why God puts you here and doing what God told you to do while you're here and being blessed of God for doing it, I'm not familiar with it. And I've had as much formal, edu any, much formal education as any neurosurgeon you got in this town or the town next to you. Don't bug me with your education, bud. Lawyers and doctors don't faze me a bit. If there's something greater on this earth than finding out what God wants you to do and doing it, I've never run into it. And I've been in Hawaii. I've been in Japan. I've been in the Philippines. I've fished in the woods of Canada. I walk the mountains and climb the mountains over there in Germany and Austria. Don't kid me. The greatest thing in this life is to find out what God wants you to do and do it. And if in doing that you get a spiritual blessing, you have attained what 98% of the people on this earth will never attain. If you can't be a pine in the top of a hill, be a scrub in the valley. But be the best little scrub by the side of the rill, be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a bush, be a bit of grass, some highway happier make. If you can't be a muskie, then just be a bass, but the liveliest bass in the lake. We can't all be captains. There must be a crew. There's something for all of us here. There's big work to do, and there's lesser to do. The lesser to do, the task we must do is near. I mean, if there's something smaller to do, it's right next to you. Do it. If you can't be a highway, then just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. You ought to want to get a blessing. Number two, there is no blessing without a sacrifice. It costs Jacob something to get a blessing. There is no blessing without a sacrifice. No way in the world. David said one time, I'll not... Uh, sacrifice anything. I'll not do anything for the Lord unless it cost me something. When he bought the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite for the altar of burnt offering of Israel, he offered to pay that farmer for the land, and the man offered to give it to him for nothing. 
And he said, I won't, I won't take anything like that for the Lord for nothing. If it's going to, if it's a matter for the Lord's service, I'm going to sacrifice to do it. There is no blessing without a sacrifice. You can't lose weight without hurting. Nobody's ever found out how to do it. This country is filled with book after book after book on how to lose weight and how to get in the diet and how to lose pounds and this and that and this and that and this and that. I'll tell you something. You'll never really lose pounds unless you do a lot of crying. <laughs> a fellow said, how's that? At the table. A fellow said one time, he said he did it by doing uh, uh, push froms. And a guy said, you mean push-ups? He said, no, push froms. I, I pushed back from the table. There is no blessing without a sacrifice. You can't develop a body with muscle of steel and reflexes like lightning unless you beat your body to death in exercise. There isn't any easy way. Again, the Germans overdo it, but they say there must be a harder way. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of humorous, you know. But the fact is, Americans are always looking for the easy way, and to get a blessing, there is no easy way. Christ said, if a man wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That isn't easy. A travel agent said to a man at the uh, ticket counter, he said, for the price you have in mind, sir, I suggest you join the Navy. <laughs> I mean, if a guy thinks he's going to see the world, you know, for $500, he has another guest coming. You better join the Navy and see the world. If you if you got in mind six, seven hundred dollars to get around the world, you're not going to get around the world for that kind of price. Next to picking up razor blade with boxing gloves, the hardest thing you have to do in your life is to have spiritual power and spiritual blessings without a cross. I know this is all hard in the flesh. I know what many of the healers and charismatics are trying to tell you. They're trying to tell you all you got to do is just speak it and have faith in it and think positive thoughts and you'll have the whole world dumped in your lap. Well, you won't. You won't. Paul prayed for the power of Christ's resurrection. The Lord said, you haven't completed that prayer. And Paul said, what's the rest of that prayer? And the Lord said, you got to pray for the fellowship of his sufferings. Listen, a Christian that is always rich and always in good health and isn't being persecuted and lied about and slandered is a sorry, good-for-nothing bum. Now, you put that down. These Christians have let this positive thinking run off with them. They're nuts with it. They're mad and they're idols. That old apostle Paul dies in that Bible without a wife, without children, without a church, without a school. He dies without a place to be buried. And he said, be a follower of me as I'm a follower of Christ. The old-time Christians used to sing, the Son of God goes forth to war, his kingly crown to gain, his blood-red banner streams afar, who follows in his train. Not very many these days. There is no blessing without a sacrifice. Thirdly, a real blessing will make anybody emotional. Often we people who believe in saying amen and shouting once in a while, we get called fanatics. We're said to be emotional. We're not as uh, fanatic as some of you dumb heads that go around a basketball game and scream your fool head off like a nut over somebody bouncing the ball up and down a piece of wood. You talk about fanatics, you put some of us out of business. Do you know that? Well, you taking that lame man got healed over there in Acts chapter 5, the Bible said he began to leap and praise God. When the remnant was at the rebuilding of the temple in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they began to shout and cry, so the voice of shouting and weeping was heard afar off, and they were mingled. Why, you take the world, they shout when they get physical blessings. Did you ever watch cheerleaders at football games? You talk about a bunch of fanatical nuts. I um, imagine actually leaping up and down. For what? I suppose tuition or pay the ball players or something. It's pretty big business, you know. Listen, we say people that get blessings, we get our emotions stirred. We get stirred up. People get there in television programs, they get a prize of a new ice box or refrigerator or range or a trip to Hawaii or something like that, and that crowd goes crazy. Clap of the hands, screaming like a bunch of idiots, and you have the nerve to call us fanatics when we say amen or glory to God or praise God when a sinner gets saved. You're one to talk. You take you people in the Cincinnati area. You know what you did this year, this last year? You sat around something like 10 below zero on cement benches and paid money to do it for over two hours. 
You paid to sit below zero temperatures where some of you so far back you couldn't even see which team was which. And you call us fanatics? Why, you old hypocrite, get the beam out of your own eye before you mess with a moat in our eye. A real blessing will make you emotional. If God really blessed you spiritually, you get a real answer to prayer, you're going to be stirred up about it. David got stirred up. He was happy the, the Ark of the Covenant was coming home and was going to be in the same town where he was. And he jumped up and down and leaped before the Ark and sang praises to God. Now, the next thing about this, some blessings are offensive to others. There isn't a way in the world you can be a blessing all the time and get away with it for some people. Do you remember what happened in John chapter uh, 12 when Jesus Christ was sitting there and the woman with the alabaster box began to anoint his feet? you know what happened? It offended the tar out of one of the brethren, one of the fellows who talked in tongues and healed. You see, Judas had the apostolic sign because he was an apostle. It was Judas in Matthew 10 who was told to go forth and heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. Now, he was a fine spiritual fellow, wasn't he? And he sat there when that woman began to pour out that alab the contents of that alabaster box. He said, why was this waste made of this ointment? It should have been given to the poor. The Bible has the succinct footnote on that, that he didn't say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and held the bag. You know what offended him? That woman showing love to Jesus Christ. That's what upset him. And you mark my words, when people who really love God begin to show some love toward the Lord Jesus Christ, some concern for Him and for His cause and for His works and for His ministry and for His disciples and for His teaching, they're going to offend a bunch of hypocrites who try to back out by talking about welfare and taking care of the poor. That's the bunch that gets offended. Do you know who gets offended when these girls' homes are set up in Texas? and these Christian schools are set up in Ohio, you know who gets offended? Well, that's easy. The people that hold the money bag. And they say, why wasn't this money given to the poor? Did you ever hear that before? It was Judas that said that. Now, you take David as a rebuke to Michael, his wife. When David came home dancing up and down in front of that Ark of the Covenant, yelling, hollering, and praising God, it was a rebuke to Michael. His wife. You know, Michael was upstairs up there. It's M I C H A L. Michal, I guess, or Michelle in French. In French. And she was up there looking out that window, and she didn't feel that way about God. And she didn't feel that way about the Ark of the Lord. It was no blessing to her to see the Ark of God coming home. She didn't care anything about it. So here's David up there dancing and singing and hollering, having himself a time, having himself as a spell, as we say down south. And she's offended. And when he comes in, she says, how glorious was the king of Israel. Real sarcasm, boy. How glorious was the king of Israel who uncovered himself today in the eyes of his handmaidens. She's upset. She's upset. Now, some of you cold, heartless Christians out there that try to drum up emotions when you don't have any and drum up faith when you haven't got any, you got a problem. And your problem is getting in fellowship with the Lord where you're happy with the Lord and He's happy with you. And as long as the root of bitterness is there, is there, your fake joy and your fake positive thinking doesn't do anything but just create confusion. Paul says, Beware lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and many be defiled thereby. Get out of fellowship with the Lord, you can't appreciate a blessing. We had a young fellow one time down home, left our church for about three years and got off with another crowd in order to play sports and hung out with a dead crowd for about three years. And after about three years, he came back to our church, was invited to sing, and he got up to sing, and it fell flat as a flounder. You know anything falling flatter in all your life. And when he came to our church and came in there and sat down and heard the shouting and saw some of the bass running, which we have sometimes, not every service, but sometimes some of the young men get tearing around the building. <laughs> it offended him, like it would offend some of you. You know what you do? You'd sit there and say, well, that's just of the flesh. 
and then go home and watch Dean Martin and Johnny Carson. That's you I'm talking about. Not your brother, not your sister, but it's you, friend. Some blessings are offensive to other people. And next, a blessing does not come by putting on a performance. David didn't uh, uh, get a blessing from his performance. He got a blessing before he began to sing and dance and praise God and jump up and down. We have an idea these days that uh, putting on a performance is a ministry. There are two different things. Uh, Brother Rollins told me one church he preached in years ago, some thing was going on there, and they put on 27 specials before the sermon. About the time he got number 24, 25, he told the pastors anymore, I'm walking off the platform. That's the right thing to say. 27 specials in one evening service is not a ministry at all. It's a performance. That's what a lot of these churches are these days. You know what they are? They're million-dollar launching pads for lady fingers. Maybe you don't know what a ladyfinger is, but a ladyfinger is an old little old firecracker we used to shoot off when I was a boy. It was about an inch and a half long, or an inch long. They call them ladyfingers. That's a lot of this business is. A blessing doesn't come by putting on a performance, putting on a show. A blessing comes by ministering. I've heard of singers who breathe right, their enunciation was right, their diction was right, their pronunciation was right. They had the phrasing and timing right. Their release and their attack on the note was perfect. They were as trained as any coloratura soprano who ever lived. But they stunk. You know why they stunk? They were showing off their voices. The Holy Spirit knows when you're showing off and when you're not showing off. I've heard old hillbilly girls sing up around Mount Airy, North Carolina, and Gastonia, and Charlotte, and Hendersonville, and Brevard, and Caesar's Head, and back there in the mountains. I've heard old country girls sing back there with horn-rimmed glasses and skirts down six inches below the knees and old bogan-type shoes. I've heard those little girls sing up there with no musical training at all, and nobody's can confront them and get up there and put their hand behind their back and cut loose. And I'm telling the Spirit of God to go through those places, man, to where you thought you were going to strangle on it. I mean, get up there and those little girls get singing... While the ages roll, I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow old, and my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while the ages still roll. Listen, I've heard that stuff in those mountain churches back there, and seen the Holy Spirit go through there like a tidal wave coming into the beach, boy. And I've heard some of these trained professionals from the highest Christian colleges and universities in the world get up there and stand and sing, My father is omnipotent, and that you can't deny. And just stink like a box of dead shrimp that been on the beach for two weeks in the sun. You know what the trouble is? You don't get any blessing. A blessing doesn't come by putting on a, a performance. All right, finally, a blessing, and this is a sobering thought, a blessing can become a curse. You read back there in the Old Testament Deuteronomy where the Lord said, I'll take your blessings and turn them into curses. A blessing can become a curse. The root of bitterness springs up from the heart. And the Bible says, out of the heart are the issues of life. When David prayed back there in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 51, about his terrible sin, he said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. He knew there was a danger inside. Pride killed the blessing for David's wife, and what should have been a blessing for her, why well, the Bible said he came home to bless his house. And what should have been a blessing for her turned out to be a curse. She didn't have any more children the day of her death. You ever stop thinking about where apostasy starts? Did you know that every age apostasy begins? When you study your Bible, you realize that every dispensation ends in apostasy. You know how the Garden of Eden ended? In it ended in failure and expulsion. You know how the pre-Noahic Earth ended? It ended in the flood. You don't have to Abraham after God blessed him and called him out. He lied about his wife. You know what happened to the sons of Jacob after God gave them the land? They went into slavery in Egypt. 
You know, after the slaves, they came out of Egypt and got in the promised land, they went after idols. We have a time of it, don't we? Now listen, when trouble comes, you can curse it, you can nurse it, you can rehearse it, or you can reverse it. And when the offense comes, the way to get a blessing is make something out of it. Do something good with it. A blessing can become a, become a curse if you don't handle it right. Light rejected becomes lightning. Apostasy in every age begins with attacking and correcting and changing the Word of God. Every time. There's one case anywhere in church history where there's any variation. And you Christians, apostasy will begin for you every time in your life when you get mad at God or get bitter at God or get offended at something God's doing. That's where it'll start. David's wife could have had a blessing. She missed it. She missed it. Too proud. Too stuck on herself. A lady said one time to a contractor busy building a building next door, she said, we've too much dust around here. We housewives can't stand all that dust day and night. One well, of those old grimy builders said, well, he said, lady, you came from dust. You're going to dust. You better get used to it. A lot of truth in that. A man said, we need more DDs. And the fellow said, what's a DD, a doctor of divinity? He said, no, down on the dust. Down on the dust. You want to miss, you want to how to miss a blessing? Just stay stuck on yourself. Just stay full of yourself. Just put yourself first. And you'll miss every blessing God has for you. I close with a remark I opened my message with. It is remarkable to me when I look back upon 32 years of the ministry and see how many Christians I've known that missed every single blessing God had for them. God has blessings in the store for His children. Many of them are physical blessings. Many of them are spiritual blessings. God has victories He wants you to win. God has sins He wants to have you overcome. God has temptations He wants to have you learn how to overcome and get victory over. God has things for you to do. He wants to give you health and strength to do them. God has a ministry for you. God has money He wants to give you to pass on to others. And like I said before, there are some Christians that have a talent. It amounts to a genius when it comes to missing everything that God has for them in this life. May God help you as my prayer, if you're a Christian, to obtain your spiritual blessings, which by right are yours in Jesus Christ. And if you're an unsaved person, whatever you do, don't miss the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of spending eternity forever in heaven with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.